Police in Oxford have discovered the body of a man in a car. He has been murdered. This murder was horrific, and it's one of those cases that I'll always remember. One, because of the ferocity of the actual attack. Secondly, the motive, why it happened. There are multiple stab wounds to his chest and a rope around his neck. The entire street is cordoned off. However careful a killer is, there's always the forensic potential to be able to catch them. The forensic team must act fast, as the clues to catching the killer lie in the crime scene. About half past 11 at night, two police officers were patrolling in that car in an area called Rose Hill in Oxford. And they came across a car which was metallic green coloured, straddled across the pavement. The nose end of the car was actually into the road. The lights were on very low, that the car engine was off. When the officers got out of their car and they approached the, the Laguna, they could see it through the windscreen and through the open window. There was one person, a young Asian man, about 19, early 20s, who was sat in the driver's seat, fatally attacked. It was ferocious, he'd been stabbed a large number of times in his chest area. That's when they secured the scene, contacted myself and other officers. You always think it's a young man, and you normally sort of think, well, what is the motive? And normally the motive would be maybe gang-related, maybe it was over a girlfriend, maybe it was over drugs. So that's perhaps the initial thoughts. We treat every crime scene exactly the same, with utmost integrity. We don't discriminate about the type of crime. We're there to recover forensic evidence, and it will take as long as it takes. We are completely impartial. Every crime scene, you only have one opportunity to capture and maximise the scientific evidence. I remember discussing with the crime scene manager what the strategy would be. The golden hour is where we really do assess what evidence we've got and where we're going to take our forensic investigation. A scene like this would have to be processed quickly but efficiently because you're in the public view. They would have got screening up as far as possible to be able to screen the car off from the neighbouring houses. The pathologist would have been called to the scene, so the examination could be conducted to see the position of the body, any blood distribution, because as soon as a body like that is moved, any blood distribution on his clothing might be lost. Around his neck, there was a piece of blue-coloured nylon rope, and it's like it was keeping in place against the back of the seat. One of our key line of inquiry was actually to identify who our victim was. Other police officers were doing some inquiries with the registered owner of the car. The registered owner of the car was visited. They made contact with mum, dad and the family. I opened the door and there was this policeman who uh, said that, this, is this car belong to you? I said yes, but my boy is using it. And he said, I've got bad news for you. They told me this story. But before the sentence finished, I just collapsed. I shout and my wife come down and I just collapsed. Police have confirmed the victim's identity as 19-year-old Oxford Brooks engineering student, Arash Gulbani. And Arash was like Angel. Such a lovely boy. So loving, so kind, not just to the family, he was kind to everyone. Everybody adored him. And that pain, the only way I can describe it, you know the magnitude of it, is someone having open heart surgery with no anesthetic. This is how it feels. Every time that you think about your loved one, your heart will not just want to pop out. <laughs> Arish was only 19 years old when he was killed. He'd never been in trouble before. He was still studying. He was an engineering student, hoping to follow his father into the world of, of, of engineering. He had lots and lots to look forward to. The CSIs must prioritise what evidence to harvest before they move the victim's body and relocate the vehicle to the forensic garage. 
Every crime scene, we're looking for forensic and a bit detailed examination. In a car, yes, you'd hope that the evidence would be contained there. You'd hope there'd be some form of cross-transference of evidence. There's a law called Low Card's Law about the cross-contamination of evidence. Every contact leaves a trace. The police are hopeful that the killer has left a trace at the crime scene. Looking for their fingerprints and DNA, their blood, any weapons. Finding the murder weapon within the, the initial crime scene is, is, a, is a great plus for us because then we can potentially find offenders' fingerprints and DNA on the handle and then obviously the victim's DNA on the blade of the knife. It's very unusual for an offender to leave a murder weapon at a crime scene. Uh, normally, if it's a knife, they'll, they'll take it away and discard it somewhere else. All the drains would have been searched, people's gardens, bushes. In this instance, we weren't able to find any weapon within the vicinity of the vehicle. Before the car is relocated to the garage, the police turn to a new technique called fibre taping. They have to cover the whole of the inside of the car and also Arash's body with bits of um, tape, sticky tape, which would then capture any alien fibres that might be there. The deceased had been sat in the driver's seat, but the offenders must have got into the car, so you were looking for any fibres from our suspects. We would always do fibre taping speculatively because we don't know, firstly, what offenders we have, what clothing they were wearing. Fibres do take a lot longer than any other trace evidence because it's done by a scientist looking down a microscope. Fantastic evidence, but it is very time consuming and costly to do. It could take several months before you get a result. When we've exhausted all of the forensic techniques, fibres can become really important but we also need to ensure that we recovered them from the start. We would carefully remove the deceased from the vehicle after doing any forensic examinations of that body in situ. And then the body would be taken to the mortuary and the car would be recovered separately. At those very early stages, we know where the vehicle was found, where it was discovered. We had no idea how the attacker or attackers actually got into the car or how they left the car. So we had to keep all options open. If we knocked on all the doors, had anyone actually been out, had anyone actually seen anything, had anyone actually heard anything, but we had nothing at all from the door to door. So you would have thought that time at night, people might be coming back from the pub. People might be going out for a walk or exercising their dog, but no one was there. It was a quiet night. It's a, a quiet estate. The detectives need to speak to the family of Arash to see if there is anyone who they suspect could have been responsible. But first, they must do the formal identification of his body. The time I first time I saw him in Motri. I kissed him. I kissed him so many times. I couldn't believe what they had done to my boy. Whilst the forensics continue to trawl for any clues, Arash's father, Rahim, believes he knows who murdered his son. I knew straight away and I was begging the police to go and arrest him. Detectives in Oxford are investigating the murder of 19-year-old university student Arash Gulbani. He's been stabbed 46 times whilst in his car, and his neck has been tied to the headrest. Arash's father believes he knows who is responsible for the murder, and has asked police to speak to the family of Arash's girlfriend, Mana. Arash's family told us about the relationship, because Arash and Mana had been going out for about 15 months. Obviously, Arash had a lot of friends, and she was the friend of a friend. And when she sees him, she fall in love with him. Mana's family didn't like the relationship. But you also heard from a couple of his friends that Mujibur, the eldest boy, and Arash didn't get on. Police act on this intelligence 
and decide to bring in Mana's brother, Mujibar Rahman. Seven o'clock in the morning, I think it was, very early stages, he was arrested. The whole family were woken up. Mujibar was upstairs in bed. He was arrested and taken away to the police station. And then other officers went in and they searched the house. On that first particular occasion, we seized any clothing. He'd been on a short break to Spain with some friends and he bought a number of knives and they were in his bedroom, so they were seized as well. So when Mujibur would have been arrested, we would have taken a number of samples from him. DNA, we would have taken fingerprints as well. What can you tell me about Arash, Bobani, Zaran? And what are your thoughts about their relationship? Why Why is that? She's supposed to get arranged marriage. That's the tradition we've all brought up to. Have arranged marriage, start family like that. Right. It was forbidden for Manor to partake in an intimate relationship, and this is not uncommon in very strict Muslim families. It can be problematic when British-born children have slightly different experiences and ideas based on what they see around them, for example, at school, in comparison to the expectations and wishes of their parents. Do you want to bring home, Sophie? Have they got any children? To your knowledge, have they got any intention of starting a family? I don't know. So was there actually a fallout between you and Arash? Me and Arash never chatted. Never spoken. Yeah. What, what religion is he then? Uh, I'd say he's a Muslim brother. I was born in Iran. The whole country is Muslim. I found out that the religion uh, wasn't for me. So I was atheist. I believe in humanity. So that's what I taught my children. I told them, you know, if they grow up, if they want, pick whatever religion they want. So what, what do the rest of the family say about this relationship? They're happy about it. Manor's father, Chomir, wanted Manor to have an arranged marriage to be with another strict religious family. Arash was not brought up to be religious and live his life according to those principles. So therefore, this may have caused a rift when Chomir found out about Arash. I started arguing. I said, stop saying. And I just gave him about two, three slaps. Because of the violence at home, she moved out and she went to live with someone else. And prior to her running away, you told her that the relationship got to stop. Yes. And during that time, while she was out, she fell pregnant. My boy told me, and I said, OK, if that's the case, I pay for everything and um, you get married. To get them married so that her family is OK as well, because when, when you get married, it doesn't matter who, as long as they, they love each other. She then had a chance meeting with mum in a shopping centre in Oxford. She was clearly pregnant. Mum managed to persuade her to come home. And I asked you if they'd ever discussed starting a family or if you had any knowledge of their plans to start a family. Do yeah. you remember that? Yeah, yeah. And you said no, you didn't know that was the case. How come your sister's pregnant and other people know about it? I believe you, President. I find that difficult to believe. I don't chat to them. Have you tried to do anything to stop them seeing each other? No. Any threats to Arash? No. The digital forensic team analysed the data from Arash's mobile phone to try and determine the time he was killed. We knew from looking at records from Arash that he'd made a couple of telephone calls to Manor during the evening. And the last phone call was, I'm just leaving home, I'm coming to pick you up now. Arash left his house at approximately 8.45. We knew it was a 10, 15 minute car journey from where Arash's home address is to where Manor was. And he never arrived. 500 metres from Manor's address, Arash was found murdered in his car. Did you know he was coming around last night to see your sister? Ooh. At the forensic garage, scientists continue to search for evidence that links the suspect to the car. 
When we examine a vehicle for a crime scene, we examine it incredibly thoroughly and we will search every single nook and cranny of that vehicle to try and find any evidence in there. The problem with a vehicle as a crime scene is it's not a sterile environment. So you're going to have a lot of contamination within the car from family members, friends, there'd be fibres from other people, there'd be items dropped. And sometimes we will find bits of evidence that we don't know if it's relevant or not. So we will take photographs of it and then we'll seize it. In this instance, there was a tiny little rivet that was found in the centre console between the two front seats near the gear stick. Took photographs of it and seized that rivet just in case it might be linked to something. The outside of the car is a very good surface for fingerprinting because it's smooth and it's shiny and there's lots of glass on the windows. Then there's a problem because even if you find an offender's fingerprint, it doesn't mean to say that they've actually committed the crime because they could have just said that they walked past the vehicle in the street and accidentally touched it. And it's very difficult for us to prove otherwise. Any fingerprints that we found on the inside of the window, we would prioritise those. There was a lot of blood in the vehicle and there's a lot of different areas of blood distribution. Because of the confined space of the car and the number of stab wounds that Arash had received, you would have been confident that the offender's clothing would be covered in blood. We would sample lots of different areas to try and ascertain who the blood belongs to, because in a frenzied attack where someone's been stabbed 40 plus times, it's quite likely that they may well have cut themselves in the process. So we're looking for that one bit of blood that might be from one of the offenders. The forensic team extracts several fingerprints and swabs, which are sent away for comparison against the national databases. The rope from Arish's neck is also analysed for any trace evidence. If someone sat in the back of the vehicle and is restraining the, the victim, you'd get a lot of pressure trying to hold the person in place. Probably get really good DNA on the sections of the rope he or she was holding from the skin cells from somebody's hand and from the sweat as well. The scientists fail to raise a DNA profile and the pathologist's report clarifies the rope's involvement in the murder. Pathologists say it was put on properly post-death, certainly wasn't used to restrain him and it didn't cause his death. There was no ligature marks there as well. The custody clock is ticking and the time they can keep Mujibar is running out. The murder took place last night. I'm now going to ask you to give me an account of your movements last night. I fell asleep about 8 o'clock. So I was Then 9 o'clock, got up, getting ready to go out. I left my house about 10 o'clock. No, caught the bus just after half past, into town. He was wearing a nice white coloured shirt, black coloured trousers. He was very relaxed, clearly not emotional. He hadn't shown that he'd been involved in the murder in that particular evening. From there, the bus, he went into the town centre. We then saw what stop he got off at. Draw some money up, cash point. And we've got CCTV in the town centre of him going, approaching the cash point and taking money out. We were able to get records from the bank how much money he withdrew and what time he withdrew that money, which corresponds with the CCTV. CCTV would then show him walking down through the town centre. Met up with my mates. He went on to buy me. There's more CCTV and images of him inside these particular venues. Yes, it's, it's packed and it's crowded, but you can still pick him out and you can still say that he is there to the early hours of the morning. He then went for something to eat before jumping on a taxi and then returned to home in the early hours of the morning, just gone three o'clock. And who's at home when you get in? Well, I met my dad last day. Um, my little brother was on. Because he shared the same room. He was asleep. Did you speak to your mum and dad before you went upstairs, before you went to bed? Mm, not really. Because they're religious. Yeah. Like, um, on Sky, there's like this religious channel. Yeah. And they were watching that. What was it when they were watching then, didn't they? Um, it's just small sites of the world. Because they have to, like, they pray on like, early hours in the morning. Got a drink. I can't eat And the next thing is, from what you told us earlier, you remember being woken up 
Yeah. The police were at the door. Yeah. So he was arrested within four hours of coming back home. The weapons and clothing seized when Mujibar was arrested have been analysed to see if they're linked to the crime scene. The weapons were shown to pathologists. There was nothing there that pathologists suspected to be the murder weapon. His clothing as well. There was nothing that was obviously bloodstained. There are no positive matches to Mujibar from the fingerprints and blood samples extracted from inside the car. It's rare not to have forensic evidence, um, but there are occasions you do get knockbacks. It might be that the offender has been at the crime scene but just not left any forensic evidence. You must not get disheartened by it and continue to search. We potentially need to look down other routes to try and link a possible offender to the, to the crime scene. At this very early stage, yes, we knew that he didn't approve the relationship. Yes, we knew that he didn't approve of Arash, yet we had no evidence to link him to the crime. In fact, we had from him his movements, which were backed up by CCTV. So there was no option other than to release him and bail him back to the family home. After the interview, they let them go. But they said they haven't got solid evidence. For the first three days, um, I just didn't know what's going on in the world. I was just collapsing every time. I developed a lot of problems, heart palpitation and blood pressure and all sorts. If a suspect's bailed, it gives us more time to be able to find more evidence to prove or disprove their involvement in the crime scene. The setback is short-lived, as Steve and his team are handed a treasure trove of evidence. The carrier bag was clearly the breakthrough that we needed. That bag was the goodie bag which contained the majority of the evidence. Thames Valley Police are investigating the murder of 19-year-old Oxford Brooks University student Arash Gulbani. Their prime suspect, Mujibar Rahman, is the brother of Arash's pregnant girlfriend, Mana. When in custody, he gave the police a detailed account of his movements the night Arash was killed which were corroborated by digital forensics. He was released on bail. The police need to find more evidence. Detectives continue with the door-to-door -door inquiries and Steve is still searching for the murder weapon. The pathologist report sheds light on what may have occurred. When we did the post-mortem examination, there were 46 wounds, all mainly around the chest area. We know it was a single-bladed weapon, and it was probably about six, seven centimetres long. There were no defence wounds. And there's a suggestion at quite an early stage, perhaps that maybe someone was in the back used a seatbelt to restrain Arash while someone else attacked him. The pathologist also made a discovery and alerted the investigation team. Inside his uh, chest pocket of his shirt, there was a small piece of metal, which was the other half of the rivet. The one that was found in the car, perhaps the, the male and the female halves had come detached. It wasn't immediately obvious what that rivet related to. It was kept and put to one side. As the detectives chase all the lines of inquiry, Arash's family continue to grieve. I hired a hall for the wedding, which I had to use it for his funeral. My oldest son, everybody loved him. And even it shows in, in his funeral, even though it was a short notice, there was over 250 people turned up. My life is gone. My family's life is gone. We can't enjoy living. We can't have it. Because he was a lovable child. And that's why it doubles the pain. The detectives have exhausted all leads and are struggling to prove that Mujibar Rahman was involved.
but they're about to be handed a massive piece of evidence that could help them catch the killer. On Tuesday lunchtime, two days later, two council workers were in an area called Rymer's Lane and they saw a red colored car pull up, the driver jump out and throw something over into the allotment. So someone they thought was fly tipping. They weren't close enough that they could get a good proper description of the driver. But they went and examined the, the bag that had been thrown over. They picked it up and looked inside and they then took it to the police station. And the person at the front counter at the police station knew of the murder and actually telephoned the incident room to let us know. I can always remember at that particular lunchtime being in the incident room and we were briefing and I think we were actually talking about forensics at that particular time. That was clearly the breakthrough that we, we needed and wanted for this particular case. It was a Tesco's carrier bag. Inside was a baseball cap, a blue Nike colored top, a pair of black heavy duty gloves. There was also a knife. Inside was a broken butterfly knife. Could we identify the knife as being used in this particular attack and the knife that was used to, to kill Arash? It may contain DNA or blood from Arash. It may also contain DNA fingerprints from the attacker. Finding the murder weapon is a massive boost to any crime scene manager or CSI, because then we can potentially find offenders fingerprints and DNA on the handle, and then obviously the victim's DNA on the blade of the knife. So just that small amount of evidence might be enough to charge the offender with the murder of Arash Gobani. The butterfly knife recovered from the carrier bag is sent to the lab for tests. When the knife was examined, they could see that inside the knife was blood. The blood was identified as belonging to Arash. The knife itself has been bent. The ferocity of the attack, the force that was used, the knife probably hit the sternum or one of the other bones in, in Arash's body and twisted. So the rivet that held the blade in place onto the handles had snapped. One part had fallen into Arash's shirt pocket while he sat in the driver's seat and the other half had fallen down to his left-hand side, near to the handbrake area. Police can confirm they have the murder weapon by connecting the knife to the victim and the crime scene. They must now analyze the other items discarded in the carrier bag. The blue Nike top on there was actually found some probably cast off blood. It was identified as being Arash's blood. Baseball caps are a really good source of DNA. The really good area is around the sweat band. So the sweat from your forehead will be transferred onto the band of the baseball cap. You can get hairs inside them. The only problem with the hairs is you don't often get the hair root. It's normally like a broken hair inside the cap. And that's a really good source of DNA. We were able to DNA profile the baseball cap and come up with an offender's name from the DNA database. The baseball cap when that was examined by the scientists. The main DNA contributor for the inside of the baseball cap was Mujibur. With Mujibur's DNA found on the baseball cap in the same bag as the murder weapon, police re-arrest him on suspicion of murder. Who's got a Adidas baseball cap? It's got your DNA within it. To me, that indicates that you may have had some involvement in what happened to Arash. I am not doing He again stuck to his account, his story. The hat, I don't know, because it was an old hat I never wore, I ain't worn that for ages. I can't remember if I lost it, but someone's taken it. He couldn't actually explain as to how his DNA was on that particular hat. We've got a red car, an old style Toyota, that's seen pull up. My father owns a red Toyota car. This is now painting a real picture to us that your family had serious involvement in the death of Arash. Dad was arrested on suspicion of being involved in the murder, also for disposing of, of the evidence as well. Chomir, again, he was extensively interviewed by police officers with an interpreter. Can you give me any explanation how these items ended up in Rhymer's line? He said yes, he would have used Rhymer's lane at that particular day, at about that particular time. But he denied stopping, he denied throwing anything over the fence. 
The forensic scientists have located a second DNA profile on the baseball cap. It belongs to Chomir Ali. Can you explain that? Back at the lab, the tests continue. Externally, on the gloves, there would have been blood. That blood was Arash's blood. So again, it links the gloves to our crime scene and to the murder of Arash. When the scientists looked at the gloves in detail, they did find a very small cut on one of the fingers. When he turned inside out, they found some blood staining inside the glove. When he tested that blood staining, it came back as if it was not belonging to Arash. The attacker had cut himself. Because of the ferocity of the attack, the knife we you know broke because the two halves of the rivets were left. So the blade probably went between the fingers of the attacker, went through the glove, cut the attacker's hand, and then the attacker has actually bled inside the glove himself. This third DNA profile was also found on the baseball cap, as well as on the Nike top that was covered in Arash's blood. We took a number of samples from all family members, and then we were shocked to find out that actually it was the younger brother, Mamnor, who was only 15 years old. It was his blood, his DNA profile, that was in that glove. Mamnor was arrested, 15 years old. He had a solicitor, he had an appropriate adult to look after him as well. The glove, the flesh stone, looks like was the layer of the glove, and the left glove has got a mixture of mice and mice and mice. Inside the glove is Mamnor's blood. So that then suggests to us that actually Mamnor was sat in the passenger seat, and because there were no defence wounds on Arash, it was probably Mujibur, the older, the stronger brother, who was in the rear using the seatbelt to restrain Arash to the seat, whilst Mamnor frenziedly stabbed him 46 times. By the time we spoke to Mamnor and interviewed him, there was no obvious sign of any cut. But he did actually say that he had a small cut there and he remembers getting a plaster. But he denied any involvement in the murder. How well did you get on with Arash? Yeah, he used to go to my school. But he's quite a bit older than he is. Yeah. There was a six of them, look. We just used to chat, chat to each other like, every day. What about my sister? How did you get on with her? She didn't quite close to me. Did she share her feelings for Arash with you? Yeah, she just loved him. He was the one that actually appeared to approve of the relationship and be supportive of Manor and actually talk to Arash. I would say that Manor moved out because of her relationship with Arash Sorry, and the parents didn't approve. Why didn't they approve of that? They wanted to get right, And that's part of the Muslim faith, isn't it? When she came back, what did she tell the family about her relationship with Arash? Well, she said she was pregnant a few months earlier than you were. 13 minutes and 15 seconds. And what about you? Yeah, I took it because... 13 minutes, exactly. She basically just came away home, so I don't know the problem. Manmore cannot account for why his DNA was found in the glove and the baseball cap. Police now confront him about the blood-covered Nike top, which also has his DNA on it. But you and Mujibar have killed them together. The forensic evidence against Mujibar and Manmor is overwhelming. And police believe their father, Chomir Ali, was more involved than just disposing of the evidence. We spoke quite extensively about the case with the Crown Prosecution Service. And together we thought we had a strong case against Dad for coercing and ordering his two boys to actually go out and to kill Arash because he didn't approve of the relationship. Well, I believe you've arranged with your boys that murder to take place. Well, it doesn't do it. We don't have any more than that. And I believe that the murder of Arash 
was around with Disneyland around 20 years. In Oxfordshire, forensics have linked 44-year-old waiter Chome Ali and his two sons, Mujibar, 18, and Manmore, 15, to the murder of 19-year-old university student Arash Kobani. The detectives believe the motive behind the murder was the fact Arash was in a relationship with Chome's daughter, Mana, who had become pregnant. Day one, this was a murder investigation of a young man and it could have been drugs, women, gang-related. It was actually nothing to do with that. This actually turned out to be an honor killing. Just the fact your daughter has left home and has become pregnant, does that not just that fact bring dishonor upon you? When a family member carries out an action that is forbidden or frowned upon, this can tarnish the family reputation, and it follows that family members may seek revenge by killing another person. Is the idea that death can expunge a stain. If they don't carry out the action to rectify the honor on the family, they may feel fearful of God and the consequences in their later life. We've got two young boys, 18 and 15, who've been persuaded by dad to actually go out and to kill Arash, the boyfriend, fiance of their daughter and sister. Honor killings at this particular time in 2004, fairly new. We spoke to a number of organizations. We spoke to a number of police officers, not just from this force, but other forces in London and asked them about their experiences and their knowledge of honor killings, why they happen. He says that honor killing is a tradition and practice from the subcontinent that's been practiced for many centuries. And he says that the custom gives parents, brothers and other relatives the right to kill women in their family or tribe on suspicion of sexual relations with a man occurring outside marriage. No, I'm not complicit. From speaking to, to, to those sorts of people, they always said, keep an open mind. There's always more than one person potentially involved. Part of the, the research that's been going on is that quite often the youngest member of the family has been selected by the father, the older brother, whoever, to do the killing. Because if that, that person is of a young age, the penalty that they may receive if anyone is going to be very much less and substantial than some of them. Often, in very strict Muslim families, children or anybody that's younger than the patriarch is expected to obey instructions and to uh, follow behaviours in accordance with their wishes. But how can you persuade a 15-year-old boy to actually go out and take someone's life? The honour is usually held or commanded by the patriarch of the family. The patriarch in this particular case was Chomir. From a criminological point of view, they believe that their actions are absolutely correct and have in fact been directed from God to behave in such a way. And Harris was stabbed 46 times in the heart. And part of that, we've been told, is that if you drain the heart of blood, you drain it of any love, you drain it of any love. So therefore, it would kill the love that he had for his daughter. And if you drain the heart of blood, Stabbing through the heart may be poetic or meaningful. Multiple stabbings may indicate that they have carried out a thorough job through God's will or God's request to carry out those actions. When Arash was found, he was in the driver's seat and he had a blue piece of nylon rope um, around his neck. Now, that's been again described as something that could be for a display in purpose. In other words, to keep the body upright, so you can see exactly what happened. And 14 seconds. I don't know. Which again fits in with the when we said that you stabbed numerous times, numerous times in the heart to drain the love from it. This honor killing thing comes back. I don't know. The rope demonstrates an ultimate control and victory over Arash in leaving him on display and an act of humiliation for him. Is it not right? But with Arash now being killed, 
Your honor has been restored. And then, to protect your boys, we decided to get rid of the property in Ram's land, and you've disposed of all these items. You've got rid of them. So you saw that. Research with offenders who take part in honour-related violence or honour killings shows that they are not necessarily concerned or worried about capture, conviction, time spent in prison, as long as they have achieved what they sought out to do, which they believe is a direction from God to behave in a certain way to protect the other members of their family. When the court case was going on, 2005, and I send a message with Leo as an officer to say that, you know, I don't mind to keep the baby. And within 24 hours, they come back and said, there's no baby. I said, what do you mean there's no baby? And they said, yeah, they, she terminated it. And then the final thing was for Mana to have an abortion. The two things that brought dishonor into your family without God, haven't they? The rash and the baby. November 2005, the case was heard at Oxford Crown Court. All three of them denied the murder investigation. Throughout this whole investigation, and when it came to court, there was never any emotion from Dad or from any of the boys. After a four-week trial, the verdicts are in. All three suspects were found guilty of murder and given life sentences. Manmore Rahman must serve a minimum of 14 years. Mohammed Mujibar Rahman was jailed for life and must serve a minimum of 16 years. The jury agreed that Chomir Ali convinced his two sons to kill Arash to restore the family's honor. He was given a life sentence with a minimum of 20 years. He was in control of his, his sons um, without doubt. He was the one that ordered them to go out on that particular night to kill Arash. As the guilty verdicts were read out, Mr. Gorbani Zarin's father shouted yes loudly and raised his fist. The three men in the dock remained completely impassive. Mamnor's counsel later told the judge her young client was almost in denial about the enormity of his situation. Today, the murdered man's family said justice had been served, on, but they could not bring their son back. It's always important to get justice for Arash for his mum, dad, brothers, sisters. They're constantly missing their son or their brother. He had a baby on the way. He had everything to look forward to. This murder was horrific, and it's one of those cases that I'll always remember. One, because of the ferocity of the actual attack. Secondly, also the motive, why it happened. And he got killed just because he had a relationship with Manor, which wasn't approved by her family. Since then, of course, there's been lots of changes in both policing, but also with schools and other agencies as well. We encourage anyone who is in a violent relationship or being coerced to do something they don't want to do to contact police or to contact social services or schools, just let someone know. There is always someone there that will listen there's always someone there that would help you. Now the youngster, they are more aware of the situation. Still is not enough because they've taken an innocent life. The punishment wasn't severe enough. That was hurting because we've lost our garage. We're gonna carry this pain to the day we die.